Hello everyone, and welcome to Introduction to R, Part 2, R Arithmetic. Now in this lesson, we are going to be learning how to use the basic arithmetic operators available in the R programming language. So we're essentially going to be using R as a very powerful calculator, and show some of the different math operations you can do that you'll be using a lot doing data analysis and data science. So I'm basically just going to go through the R kernel that I already have written on this topic. I will leave a link to this kernel in the description of the video, so feel free to link to that and fork it if you would like, and you can interact with it yourself and run things and try things out yourself. But I'm just going to go through and show you some of the different operators that you can use. So you can see in this first code cell here, we have uh, an addition operation. So as you might expect, you use the plus sign to do addition in R. So if we run this cell, I think you can guess what the output might be, but let's see what happens. So the output is 15. So the plus just adds two numbers, as you might expect. The minus sign is the subtraction operator, so that will do subtraction. And that is five. You use the asterisk for multiplication. So the output of this one should be 50. And you use the slash for division. So the output of this one should be two. There we go. And the little caret symbol is used for exponentiation. This is actually different than some languages. Some languages use a double asterisk. Um, instead of a caret, so that's this is actually one that is good to remember, that it's different. So you actually see what happens if we run this. 1000. Hmm, I guess you can use either one in R. That's interesting. Learn something new every day. I always use the caret because it's what you use in calculators and whatnot. But apparently the double asterisk might work as well. I'm not used to using that one. Um... And addition and multiplication and exponentiation follows a specific order of operations. It follows the order that you would think of if you're used to doing math with these operators. So addition and subtraction are performed last. Multiplications are performed um, after that and or before that. And then exponentiations are performed first at least in terms of these three. So if we run this, it's actually going to perform this operation first. So five to the two will happen, and then the multiplication will happen, and then the addition will happen. So let's see what the output of this is. 77, let's see where we got that. So five to the two is 25. 25 times three is 75, plus two is 77. So that is correct based on the order of operations. So if you wanted to perform this calculation, but in a different order, say you wanted the addition to happen first or something like that, you need to insert parentheses to enforce order of operations. So you can see in this one, we have inserted parentheses. And by doing that, the innermost parentheses is executed first. So in this case, we will execute the addition first. So a five will be made in here. And then we'll execute the multiplication second, because we have another set of parentheses. So that will be 5 times 5, which will be 25. And then we'll square it. I think that's 625, but we'll see. There we go. So by using the parentheses, we were able to get the order of operations we may have wanted in that case. Now, if you're new to programming, you may not be familiar with the modulus operator or modulo. It's another common operator used in programming. So in R, to do the modulo, it's a double percentage sign like this. And what the modulus does is it gives you the remainder when you take one number and divide it by a, another. So in this case, we're taking 100, we're dividing it by 75, and then we're getting the remainder of that operation. So in this case, the remainder should be 25. So that will be the result of this modulo here. There we go. Um, it's just a good thing to know. It, it can come up in certain situations. It's not necessarily something that's specific to data science or data analytics, but uh, it's something that is good to know how to do. Um, beyond the symbolic operators that we've covered, that where you can just type a single or 
maybe two symbols to do something. There are a lot of built-in functions as well. And a function is simply a named operation that takes some input and then produces some output from it. So whenever you see a name, like you can see here log, and then a parentheses, log is the name of the function, and then the parentheses is where you pass in input. Um, functions can take different numbers of input values, but these simple mathematic ones, you basically just need to pass in one value that you're trying to do the operation on. So in this case, the log function here will take the natural logarithm of the argument. So if we run log on 2.7183, which is close to the value e, this should spit out something very close to one. It's an irrational long number, I believe, so we can't get exactly one without putting in the true value of e there. Um, the x fun function raises e to the power of its argument. So we'll run that. That's some big number. The square root function, sqrt, returns the square root of the argument. In this case, we're doing square root 64. That should return 8. The absolute value function, abs, here will return the absolute value of the argument, so it'll basically just take off the negative. Um, something I forgot to say when we're doing sub subtraction is that putting a minus in front of a number just makes it the negative version of the number. So here, we're taking the absolute value of negative 10, so that should return positive 10. And the value pi in R just returns the constant pi, so we'll run that. 3.14, don't know how many digits that is, but it should suffice for most purposes. Um, there are several functions in R as well for rounding numbers, and this is actually something you'll probably be doing a fair amount in data science, and especially if you're working with fairly large data sets, because sometimes a large data set that has a lot of precision in the floating point number, it might be unnecessary to have that amount of precision, and cutting it off to a certain decimal place can actually save a decent bit of memory in some applications. So this is something that is good to know how to do. So to round numbers, you just use their round function. So here we're rounding 233 with three decimal places, and you can see it rounded it off to the nearest whole number. You can also add an optional argument to round, so we'll show that. So in this case, we're passing in two different arguments. The first one to round is the actual number we're operating on. And then we have this second, second argument here, digits equals one. So we're telling the function, not only do we want to round this, but we want to round to the first decimal place. So instead of rounding to the whole number, we're actually going to round to the tenths place. So the result of this should be 233.2, I believe. There we go. And you can also round in the opposite direction of the decimal point by using negative numbers. So for instance, if we want to round maybe a very large number and leave a bunch of zeros at the end of it, you can do that with rounding with a negative. So in this case, we're rounding to negative two, which means we'll cut off all everything after the decimal place is definitely cut off, but then we're rounding two places before the decimal. So we're gonna be rounding to the hundreds place here. So this should round to 200. There we go. And there are a few different rounding operations. The normal round function rounds up or down to the nearest value, but you can use floor if you always want to round down. So in this case, we're passing in 2.8 to floor. And even though that's closer to three, floor always rounds down. So this is gonna become two when we run this. And the opposite of floor is ceiling. So ceiling will always round up to the next whole number you're rounding to. So in this case, 2.2 you would think should round down to 2, but with ceiling it rounds up to 3. And there's one final rounding function here called truncate or trunk, and what that does is it rounds in the direction of 0. So if you have a positive number like 2.6, it's going to round towards 0, so it's going to round down to 2. But if you have a negative number like negative 2.6, it's actually going to round up towards 0 to negative 2. So let's run that. There we go. Now there are a lot of other arithmetic operators and operations and built-in functions and things that exist in R. These are some of the most basic ones. 
that you'll be using a lot just to get us started. So if you have questions about a, an operation you know about that I didn't cover here, chances are if you just search Google for that, you'll probably find um, a blog post or a Stack Overflow article or something useful that will allow you to get a function, your hands on a function that will do that for you. Um, if you can't find something that will do a mathematical operation that you want to do, you're probably going to have to write a custom function to do that. Um, and that is something we will learn how to do later on. I think it's in maybe lesson 10 or 11 of this guide. So if you need to do that, you can feel free to skip ahead to that future lesson. So that's about it for this lesson on basic R arithmetic. In the next lesson, part three, we will be going into the atomic data types in R. So stay tuned.